Today, we're going to discuss minerals, specifically trace minerals, and we're going to focus in on their role as cofactors for certain enzymes. We're going to talk about why certain minerals are required to support the activity of certain enzymes and certain biological processes. We're going to talk about the relative requirements of these minerals in comparison to both each other, but also in comparison to vitamins and the major minerals. We're going to then talk a little bit about the specific enzymes that are associated with minerals so you can predict the consequences of a particular mineral deficiency on human physiology. We're then going to talk a little bit about how the cellular transport of minerals can be an important underlying genetic factor to mineral-related deficiencies. We require minerals for a variety of functions in our bodies. They can aid enzyme catalysis by functioning as cofactors. They're important parts of building bones and tissues. Think of calcium in your bones. They can provide ion gradients. For example, sodium and potassium are important for ion gradients. And they can ensure osmotic balance, ensuring the right amount of water is in cells and is in our blood. However, all minerals, every single one of them, are dietarily essential. We cannot make minerals from any other precursor. And we're constantly urinating out minerals, which means that we need to constantly have an ingestion of minerals. Salt and minerals always must be obtained in our diets, no exception. We can never make any salts or minerals. Furthermore, salt and minerals are excreted. This can be in our feces, our sweat, in our urine, which means that every time we excrete a particular mineral, be it a major or a minor mineral, we must reobtain that mineral from our diet. Again, these are exclusively essential. They cannot be made under any circumstance. You can break minerals down into the major minerals or the minor minerals, also known as trace minerals. The major minerals are generally play roles in growth of tissues, membrane potential, and osmotic balance. Whereas the trace minerals are generally required for catalysis, working as cofactors and enzymes, or aiding in transport. So how much of these do we need? Well, the requirements of minerals actually are a pretty wide range. Generally, we require more of them than we require for vitamins, but quite a bit less than for the essential amino acids or omega-3 and omega-6 fatty acids. Across that range, we can subdivide minerals into major minerals or trace minerals. Major minerals, such as calcium or sodium or potassium, are required somewhere between 0.3 and 2.6 milligrams per day for an adult female. However, trace minerals are required at much lower amounts. For example, fluoride is only required at 3 micrograms per day, a like, vanishingly tiny amount. This ranges up to iron, which is required at 8 milligrams per day. The requirements for any individual trace mineral are dependent on what biological processes it helps with and how effective are we at absorbing it from our diet. Shown here is a comparison of the requirements of the various minerals, the major and the minor minerals. Again, this illustrates that there's a very large range of how much each mineral we need. This depends on what they're used for in the body and also depends for how many enzymes require that particular mineral. It also depends somewhat on our ability to absorb and store those minerals in our bodies. So what do these trace minerals do? So again, these are the minor minerals. They're required in generally microgram to milligram amounts per day. Shown here is a list of the minerals and some of the key proteins and effects they have. So for example, fluoride is important for the deposition of hydroxyapatite in their teeth. So therefore, it's associated with strength of teeth. On the other hand, molybdenum is required for the activity of various enzyme oxidases, which are important for detoxification processes, among other things. Iron, for example, is required in hemoglobin and is critical for oxygen transport throughout the body. Knowing what these minerals are, what their key proteins are, helps you understand what the key effects are. So pause the video for a moment and try to get a sense of how would the particular mineral associated with its effect on a particular protein affect a process. So let's go through an example, thyroid hormone. Thyroid hormone requires the micronutrient iodine, abbreviated here as I. Shown here on the right is the structure of the two thyroid hormones, T3 and T4. You can see intrinsic to the structure of both T3 and T4 is iodine atoms. Again, that iodine must be obtained in our diet in order for that to be integrated into the thyroid hormones. Having functional thyroid hormone signaling is important for supporting our metabolic rate and important for growth and development. So people who have thyroid deficiency are often at risk of excessive weight gain due to decreased metabolic rates. There are several enzymes involved in reactive oxygen species detoxification. For example, glutathione peroxidase requires the cofactor selenium and superoxide dismutase requires the cofactor manganese and copper. There's two different isoforms of superoxide dismutase, one manganese-specific one and one copper-specific one. These are important for the activity of these enzymes. 
And it turns out these two enzymes play a role in something called antioxidant detoxification. Shown here is a reactive oxygen species that is generated. If this builds up, this can cause cellular damage. So they're detoxified by the enzyme superoxide dismutase. This generates a peroxide, which can further be broken down by either catalase or glutathione peroxidase. If you have a deficiency in selenium, which helps support glutathione peroxidase, or manganese or copper, which supports superoxide dismutase, that means you cannot effectively detoxify these peroxide radicals or the oxygen free radicals. This means that those free radicals can build up and you can be at high risk of oxidative stress. A third example is how a micronutrient can support transport. Shown here is the structure of heme within hemoglobin, the protein that is required for the transport of oxygen. That iron is critical for the binding of oxygen and transport of oxygen from our lungs to our other tissues. If you don't have sufficient amounts of iron, you cannot generate functional hemoglobin and therefore you cannot effectively transport oxygen throughout the body. In fact, iron deficiency is the most common micronutrient deficiency worldwide. All minerals that have an adequate intake or recommended daily allowance are associated with some particular physiological deficiency. For example, lack of fluoride can result in tooth decay, or lack of iron can result in anemia or hypoxia. However, minerals can also build up to be too high of levels, and they can result in toxicities. For example, just like fluoride, the lack of fluoride can result in tooth decay, too much fluoride can result in pitted teeth or joint pain due to aberrant bone growth. Similarly, while a lack of molybdenum can result in tachycardia or brain damage, too much molybdenum can result in gout. What this means is that most minerals, these trace minerals, are required to be ingested within a range, more than is required for the deficiency, but less than that's required for the toxicity. Therefore, most minerals have set adequate intakes or recommended daily allowances, this is the minimum amount you need, and a tolerable upper limit, which is amount by which too much can cause some disease. For most of these, the range is quite wide. For example, if you look at copper, they require 20 micrograms per day, but you can have up to 10 milligrams per day without a risk of disease. Similarly, iron, the lower intake is eight milligrams per day, but it doesn't become toxic for about a five-fold range, up to about 45 milligrams per day. Some minerals, such as chromium, don't have any known toxicities, so they have no tolerable upper limit. Whereas other minerals, such as nickel, vanadium, and boron, might be ingested, but don't have any critical role in our biology. So therefore, we don't need to get any of it, but they still do have toxicity levels, because there may be environmental exposures to those minerals. There are several factors that can modify how an individual has a specific requirement for a mineral. The main factor here is transport, and this is transport both in and out of our gut, and in and out of our cells because minerals need to get into our bodies and then into the specific cells at the right time. There's a variety of enzymes called oxidases and reductases. They can affect the valency of an ion, for example, iron 2 plus to iron 3 plus. There's also a variety of hormones that can regulate the uptake or release or excretion of pertinent minerals, depending on its ability to sense the levels of a nutrient. Some of these we understand quite detailed, for example, iron, whereas others we're only just now starting to learn. A fifth factor is the cross-transport of minerals. So several minerals share transporters. So if you have too much of one mineral, it may impair the ability to either absorb or excrete another mineral. Shown here on the right is an example of an enterocyte. So this is a cell of the gastrointestinal lining. You can see there's a variety of zinc transporters. ZIP4 is important for zinc absorption, whereas ZNT5B is required for zinc excretion. So therefore, the levels of ZIP4 and ZNT5B can regulate whether we're absorbing or secreting zinc. This dictates whether or not somebody is actively absorbing or actively excreting each of these. It's likely that there are similar transporters for all of the minerals we've talked about today. Minerals are required in our bodies at a range of levels, but minerals are always essential nutrients. Under no circumstances can we generate minerals within our bodies. These minerals have a variety of roles. They can support enzymatic function, they can help with hormone synthesis, they can build cellular structures such as bone, and they can facilitate cellular transport, such as hemoglobin. These trace minerals generally have pathophysiology associated with a deficiency, and most minerals also have pathophysiology associated with an excess. So we need to identify a range by which the intake of that mineral is appropriate. There are several genetic and physiological factors that can underlie the mineral intake and mineral level relationships. These are largely at the level of transporters that regulate whether or not a mineral is actively transported or excreted into a cell, into the blood, or into our digestive tract for excretion. 
Trace minerals play a large variety of roles in our bodies, even though we require very tiny amounts of them. As such, there's a range. We often set both lower and upper limits to ensure that we have enough for proper function, but not so much that we have toxicity. Understanding the cell biology of mineral transport and how that is regulated will allow us to better predict how an individual responds to both the limiting or excess of a particular mineral.